So I realize that I have this unfair role that first I have to talk about dry glossary and terminology, and now after lunch. I don't know if I should take this as a hint, but... Okay. Um, but I can promise you that once I'm through my slides, we will have another fascinating panel as we had in the previous uh, section. So just keep your eyes open for another 15 minutes. I am going to look at um, ideas around evaluation approaches for DNI, including study designs, and then thinking about key metrics and measurement issues and how those might be resolved by thinking about our research questions as a starting point. So this visual is uh, pretty simple. And it just tries to re remind us that ideally when we start to think about design or for a study, our starting point should not be thinking of what, which study designs are good study designs, which study designs are bad study designs, but rather what our research question might be, what kind of information we need to collect to answer that research question, and then that might inform us what kind of study design can provide that information. So um, this is just to open our mind and think that there are certain designs that are more rigorous for certain type of research questions, but being more broad in terms of dissemination and implementation research will be essential so that you can answer the actual questions that this field has. So I wanted us to, uh, again, go back and reflect on what are the major research questions for dissemination and implementation research. When we are thinking of tra uh, traditional basic or efficacy research, very often the question is, does this policy program intervention work, and usually it's implied that it's under optimal conditions and with selected populations. And that leads to certain study design approaches. Very often these studies use homogeneous select populations and settings. They try to control for confounding or contextual factors. And um, usually they focus on one or two main outcomes. And the answer to the question is just to simplify it, yes or no. Usually very simple answers. When we move into the dissemination and implementation research area, our research question becomes a little bit longer. The question is more when, where, how, with whom, under what circumstances, and why does this thing work? And for, to be able to answer that question, our study design choices are going to be different. We are going to think usually of complex interventions with heterogeneous populations and settings. Uh, the context is going to be messy, and we are not going to try to control for the context, but rather try to account for it. So rather than getting it out of the picture, trying to understand it and measure it. And uh, we are going to focus on diverse outcomes that are able to answer this very question. Finally, the answer will be obviously more complex. So just to take a different spin on this and remind all of us of this uh, existing tension between internal and external validity in study design, internal validity being uh, the uh, ability to draw co causal inference by the extent to which a study minimizes confounding, and then thinking of external validity is the generalizability or real-world applicability of the findings. So clearly the design that we choose will be uh, most likely maximizing one to the uh, damage of the other, but there are ways to find balance between the two and uh, measurement approaches that are able to maximize um, this balance and also just measuring all the confounding that we call confounding in traditional studies and here more contextual factors will be essential. So I am stealing this from the same person who is sitting right there, all three quotes. But I think that these three uh, quotes are wonderful to initiate our thinking. So what kind of study design do we want? The first one says, if we want more evidence-based practice, we need more practice-based evidence. The second one, for every complex problem, there is an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. And then insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So basically, the designs that we want to use in DNI will be ones that can generate practice-relevant evidence. We want to use designs that can take care of this complex situation and not control for it, but rather account for it. And finally, we might want to reach out to alternative study design approaches than the traditional ones, although very often we will still be able to use our traditional designs with some modifications. 
without the intention to be comprehensive or explain any of these in detail. I just wanted to throw out a few study designs and um, uh, just approaches that you might want to keep in your mind when you are thinking of DNI. Adaptive designs, mediation analysis, analysis that is able to explain pathways, uh, system science and complexity science that can actually take into account a lot of different stuff and messiness, mixed methods approaches that collect both quantitative and qualitative data, using theory-based approaches and realist evaluations. Some of you attended the webinar this Monday uh, with Brian Mittman, and he talked more about this. Multi-level designs that are able to account for, again, the messiness and multi-level nature of DNI work. And uh, some of us will still go back and use observational approaches, including observational comparative effectiveness studies, which uh, you have great methodologies provided by ARC. Uh, there is also a language for the comparative effectiveness research, T, translational, which was coined, if I right, by John Steiner and Raz Glasgow. And actually, there is a chapter in the Bronson book uh, on that idea. And um, very often, quasi-experimental studies will be used in this area because randomization is not practical or not feasible. And the one design that I would like to say more about is the pragmatic clinical trials, because those seem to marry the internal rigor with the external validity improvement. And so uh, I will tell more about those. Before I do that, I wanted to show you the same study that we keep carrying through the day um, of the R01s, uh, DNI R01s that were analyzed based on the abstract, and show you what kind of study designs those R01s used. So the most common was quasi-experimental design, as I mentioned. Uh, still a large number of randomized control trials are used. It's not specified if they are pragmatic or explanatory. Uh, system science had a very large number, which is really nice to see, especially they list here social network analysis. Um, there were some case study approaches, CBPR, and then some of them were unclear, one of them, I guess. And then there were a number of studies that had multiple study designs included, and uh, again, a number of studies used mixed methods, and this is over 46 abstracts, just to remind you. So pragmatic or practical clinical trials are the trials that we will just talk a little bit more about. Some of uh, our presenters will be actually showing you examples, and you have already heard one by Ali um, that was a pragmatic trial that they used. The purpose of these trials is usually to answer questions that decision makers have, decision makers being a very broad term, um, including providers, physicians, but potentially even patients who make decisions about on healthcare decisions. And very often, they uh, compare to an alternative relevant uh, intervention. They recruit participants from heterogeneous settings, and the participants are diverse. And uh, they use, include a broad range of outcomes. Obviously, saying that a study is explanatory or, or traditional clinical trial or pragmatic trial uh, yes or no binary is not always true. There is usually a spectrum of study features. And one way to think about this is using the pragmatic explanatory continuum indicator summary, or precis that we have listed here. They basically develop the method of looking at 10 different aspects of a study design and measure whether on those aspects the study rates more on the explanatory or more on the pragmatic side. And uh, one example is eligibility criteria. A study that is very pragmatic would want to include people from a wide variety of settings and with almost any kind of condition. With an exploratory approach, they are starting to exclude individuals based on potentially they are, uh, if they don't have high uh, chances of responding to a treatment or they don't have high risk of developing a certain outcome. With that, the obviously, our conclusions that can be made are going to be less generalizable. Similarly to that, a more pragmatic trial will allow for some flexibility in terms of how the intervention is implemented. The more explanatory will want to train the implementers very well and rigorously control what's actually happening. And that's true for the other components. I don't want to spend too much time here. 
I did want to show you that there is a very neat way of looking at this in a visual aspect. It's called the spoke and wheel diagram. I always have to write it down because I, I don't know why I always forget. But this is basically the visual um, description of whether a study is pragmatic or explanatory across these 10 domains. And so obviously the study uh, that is on the, for you it's on the right side, it's going to be a highly explanatory study. And then the other side is the, the pragmatic trial, and then anything else can happen in between. So you can think about this um, resource, something that you can use. And I know that Russ might mention it, but there are some uh, changes in uh, this area, so I will let him talk about it. But this is something that has been tested with different types of interventions. And here are some readings that you will find online about design. I'm briefly going to talk about now measurement. Again, thinking about the main research question that we have in DNI of when, where, how, with whom, under what circumstances, and why does a something work. We also want to be thoughtful about what kind of measures we need to collect. Usually we think about what to measure, how frequently, when, with what duration. And finally, I would like to add that with what kind of instruments. This is going to be a key component of uh, DNI research, the characteristics of the instruments or the meta information about the instruments. A few possible answers for DNI research might be to use diverse set of outcomes, including adverse outcomes and cost. We heard in the previous panel that most of the studies actually did account for cost, which I was really excited to hear, and I wanted to ask more about it. Um, using and uh, collecting not only outcome measures, but also process measures, which will provide some understanding of why something happened in a certain way. Um, Measuring at multiple levels, we talked about the multi-level uh, approaches and collecting data from various stakeholders, using a mix of quantitative and qualitative data. And then finally, I'm not going to go further, but practical measures uh, would be important. Someone will actually talk today about what practical measures might mean in terms of DNI. <clears throat> These are a set of implementation outcomes that Anola Proctor and colleagues at WashU identified uh, as uh, additional outcomes that you want to measure in an implementation study. This set of outcomes has been used in the past for a number of additional initiatives. I will mention one in a moment, uh, and it has been published. Um, but there are some other ways of thinking about, obviously, outcomes and process outcomes. And uh, again, uh, there will be some more information about how you think about practical measures, but one differentiation between traditionally um, qualifying whether a measure or instrument is appropriate or not is contrasting the gold standard measure rating criteria with the practical measure rating criteria. The practical measure rating criteria is more focusing on the real world application or applicability of the given instrument. And uh, this is an, uh, one way to think about that, including feasibility, how important it is to stakeholders, <coughs> actionable, user-friendly, low cost, do no harm, etc. And we will see examples of that uh, in uh, a couple of presentations in a moment. So you might ask the question, where do I find appropriate DNI instruments and measures? And um, Good question. Um, there are a couple of initiatives, ongoing initiatives, that are trying to opa, catalog after that, uh, existing measures, and they use actually different approaches. The first one is the Seattle Implementation Research Collaborative. They have an instrument review project. They use a systematic approach of identifying instruments, and they are trying to reach across different topic areas and disciplines. They are also, they have developed um, rigorous uh, rating criteria to rate these measures. They are in the process of doing that, and they are going to make these available on their website as a repository, and eventually they are going to make some recommendations based on a consensus approach. They have currently 450 instruments, and uh, they are in the process of rating. Please look at their website, keep looking at it. Within a year, they are going to make them available. They are going to have publications coming out on the process in the coming few months. And this is just to let you know that actually they are using the CIFR uh, framework that Julie is going to describe to us in a moment uh, to identify constructs that are important and Anola Proctor's implementation outcomes that you I just mentioned. And then the other approach is perhaps the other end of the spectrum, if I may say. Uh, this is using the uh, NIH or National Cancer Institute portal. That is a wiki-based portal. Some of you might know the grid-enabled measures portal. It was developed to 
create a wiki-based platform for researchers using crowdsourcing approach. To make it simple, it's basically Amazon.com. Um, the idea of having them submit recommendations for uh, rating and comments about tools. And uh, they have developed it for different kind of behavior science topics. We did develop a DNI-focused work initiative there. And right now we have 74 constructs and 130 different measures for DNI. They also have other topics of uh, cancer survivorship and uh, actually an EMR project that Russ led up. Uh, so you can, again, freely go there and use the resource. They have metadata on each instrument, which means information about the content and the validity. And uh, we actually also did those ratings that I just showed you, the gold standard and practical ratings for some of the measures. And this is just a screenshot of that. Okay, I think that I am done.